Hi, my name is uh, Stephen Peck, a Green Roof professional, co-founder of the World Green Infrastructure Network and president of Green Roofs for Healthy Cities North America. Uh, welcome to the virtual summit and our session on green walls and maintenance. Uh, over the past five years, Green Roofs for Healthy Cities has been working with green wall manufacturers, designers, installers, and maintenance professionals uh, to conduct research on the performance of, of green facades in particular, but also to develop an introductory green roof training course and really try to bring the green wall industry together to develop products and services that improve the overall uh, industry as we move forward and grow. As many of you know, the green wall industry has been growing uh, fairly rapidly over the past several years, and there's a number of new technologies and systems that are in the market. And with me today uh, to help talk about these systems and in particular focus on the issue of maintenance, we have three uh, green wall experts with us. We have Melissa Daniels, James Sable, and Christopher Lyon. Um, Melissa Daniels has been in the horticultural business for over 25 years, working in landscape design and maintenance uh, and wholesale nursery container uh, nursery production. Ms. Daniels is the co-owner of Plant Connection, a 42-acre growing facility which specializes in green roof and green wall products. Uh, Plant Connection Incorporated are the developers and distributors of the Grow O2 living wall system. Melissa is also an expert uh, instructor for the Green Roofs for Healthy Cities Green Wall course. Uh, with me also is James Sable, who is the Executive Vice President of Green Screen, uh, which is a leader in greed facade technology with over 6,000 6, projects installed across North America and throughout the world. Um, he has uh, experience as a builder, a general contractor, as an architectural project manager, and for the last dozen years has visited and documented over 600 green wall installations of every scale and variety. He's co-authored the recently released distance learning course, Considerations for Advanced Green Facade Design. And last but not least is Christopher Lyon, the president of Turnicell Siteworks, which is a Northern California-based manufacturer of living wall systems, as well as numerous other products for creating landscapes on structures. He has been a member of the jury of the Green uh, Cities Allies uh, Green Roof and Wall Awards of Excellence contest for several years and is a manufacturer of uh, green wall systems. Welcome to all of you and welcome to the uh, virtual summit. Uh, let's, start with, uh, let's start with you, James. Um, perhaps you could describe uh, green facades as a category of uh, green wall uh, systems. Maybe you could tell, tell us a little bit about these systems and how they function. Uh, well, there are a few differences between how walls systems are designed and principally facade systems are basically a curtain that sits in front of a wall or can be mounted on a wall, but it is a, a freestanding structure as well, so it can delineate space, it can be out in space and sort of incorporate uh, outdoor areas, it can also uh, provide windbreaks or screens, it does not necessarily need to be mounted onto a wall surface, but plants generally grow from uh, the ground surfaces or from containers and planters, and they are uh, also available as cascading plants onto a facade screen as well. So there's a variety of uh, different implementations that can be used as different kinds of elements throughout an architectural project for uh, describing space uh, involving rain gardens or signage and other kinds of applications where uh, living architecture components can be incorporated. And uh, facades typically use climbers, is that right? Mostly. Uh, most geographic areas are, have vines that are adaptable to their climate conditions. But also there are runners and scramblers or plants that are a little more woody in nature that are also able to establish themselves and be integrated into a facade structure and trained and fulfill all the benefits that uh, the other plant varieties would as well. And what kind of uh, materials are used to support plants? Uh, they can be a wide variety of plant type uh, structure materials. Certainly you can use anything as well as cables and different kinds of stainless steel cables or different kinds of rods and wire structures. Uh, wooden trellis scapes have been used for a really long time as well. Different kinds of organic strings have been used in big projects as well. And uh, thin wire metal structures are also able to be created as panel types uh, that are used modularly for covering large areas as well. And do you sometimes get combinations of different materials to support these plants? 
Uh, we, uh, d depending on the design intent, a lot of times uh, structural panels or uh, modular panels are used with cable systems because there's different architectural components that need to be used. And uh, often they can also be in integrated into other systems that incorporate living wall components uh, with plant materials are actually going from a vertical substrate system. And so they work in combination together. So it really depends on the design intent and what the scale of the project is. Uh, generally, for larger scale projects, it's usually a singular type of uh, facade component. Okay, um, so green facades, one important uh, category of green walls. Uh, Melissa, perhaps you could describe to us uh, what we refer to as living wall systems and what they're made of and how, how they function. Um, the main distinction about a living wall system as opposed to a green facade would be because the roots of the plants are actually in the vertical wall surface rather than being in the ground or in a container and then the plant material growing up a, a trellis or a um, vine or wine, wire system. The actual roots of the plants are in the vertical surface. They're held there in a number of different ways. It could be a, with a a hydroponic system where you would have a kind of a growing media that would be a capillary felt type item or it would be actually a modular system with a system of trays or boxes that hold soil media or also hydroponic materials that the plants can anchor into on that vertical surface. Most of the time, so, those systems have an irrigation system built in of some sort. Sometimes they service the modular trays with uh, water, which is moving through those trays through capillary action, or it's actually a, an entire network of irrigation behind, in between a PVC layer and a capillary felt layer that runs through the entire vertical wall. Now, James referred to green facades as potentially being standalone systems or anchored to the building. How does a, a living wall system relate to the building envelope typically? Um, we've actually seen that happen both ways. There are times when you, you can adhere directly to the building surface. Sometimes an, a freestanding armature is built slightly off of the building to hang the modular systems onto in the case where the wall wasn't structurally strong enough to hold the weight or there were waterproofing concerns or that sort of thing. Okay and in terms of plant material can you say anything in terms of the types of plant material that we might see uh, with a living wall system in contrast perhaps to a green facade? Um, a green facade system has some advantages for plant survivability because the plant roots actually live in the ground where they are more insulated, they are protected from the elements. Uh, the, the plant roots in a living wall system are a little more exposed to the elements. So there are considerations you have to remember as far as hardiness, of course, plant appropriateness in the region and in the site in particular. Okay. Um, Chris, uh, you're a, a manufacturer of a, um, a, a living wall system that I understand can be used inside or outside of a building. Uh, have you got anything you'd like to add about the differences or the types of uh, interior green walls, how they might differ from an exterior one? Yeah, thank you, uh, Stephen. The, there's actually a number of different kinds of systems that could be used indoors. And uh, some of the same systems that are used exterior can also be used in interior living walls. Uh, in fact, uh, the soil-based systems and the modular systems that Melissa mentioned are commonly used in interior applications. There's a, uh, a new, relatively developing category of interior living walls that are also non, uh, it, rather than being uh, planted directly into a soil held onto the wall with a series of rails or on a series of boxes, uh, frequently, the interior walls now are created by hanging a series of individual grow pots. Uh, it's traditionally the way that plants are maintained in commercial applications, uh, at least throughout the United States, and it's a fairly simple way to maintain plants in an interior application and still be able to change them out quickly on, an in on a uh, wall-type scenario. It allows for plants to go on that, are, uh, are, that don't need to be grown in quite so much. They're already pre-grown into their nursery containers 
these nursery containers are then traditionally dropped into either a tray or a series of, uh, of buckets, as you will. And those are hung directly on the, the uh, these, these structures are hung directly on the wall. And so uh, by creating uh, these large modular panel systems full of these uh, plants in their grow pots, you actually can do easy change outs for interior applications. Uh, you can use a wide variety of different plants that are grown for mostly interiors. There's a, a broad, broad variety of plants that are applicable for this type of application. And uh, between that and the modular systems, uh, interior seems to be quite a rapidly growing portion of the, uh, the living wall market space. Okay, I'm wondering if you might comment, Chris, on you know why why invest uh, the extra money in, a, in a, an interior living wall system? What are you seeing uh, from the design community and the and the developers, the building owners? Like, why are they in, uh, putting the extra resources up to to build these systems? Well, there are fundamentally two different reasons you would put this uh, this in there. The the more uh, architectural structural reason is that there are. Uh, there's at least one system, and, uh, and in some cases, multiple systems, where owners are driving towards better indoor air quality. And uh, in, in typically, in an interior application, plants are known to remove uh, known pollutants out of the air in an interior setting. So when you have a lot of people, or you uh, have a large area that you're trying to, uh, in fact, clean up the air in, in a rather green application, you can use these plants to clean the air. So there are some interior wall systems that uh, by either moving air through a, uh, a hydroponic uh, blanket or simply by having the plants there, the owners are choosing this as a way of greening, as a way of uh, cleaning the air. Uh, the secondary and probably more common, at least right now, reason for putting plants in interior applications is that it's really an aesthetic element that uh, owners really appreciate. Uh, you know, people have been putting plants in indoors for hundreds of years. Uh, they want to experience a little bit of that in, that exterior in their interior application, especially if they're going to in somewhere where you spend a good portion of your time indoors. So bringing plants into the indoor environment is actually quite uh, it, it's it's quite dramatic. It's quite impressive. If you can actually use it to create art on wall, it's uh, it's a rather it's a unique way of treating an interior space that really uh, is especially today uh, gaining favor with a lot of designers and architects. Mm -hmm. So two principal reasons for doing the in interior living wall system. James, what about the green facades? Why are, why are people uh, building green facades? What would you say the principal drivers behind the industry are right now? Well, I think that what I'm seeing mostly is incorporation into policy initiatives where we've uh, sort of captured our urban spaces and created a lot of park surfaces. And we're looking for opportunities for greening that environment and quite literally uh, creating the biomass back into those spaces that has been subtracted and done in a variety of combination of ways where you're um, sort of multiplying the benefits for the aesthetic reasons that Chris just described, but also uh, maybe incorporating into rain garden considerations or you're also dealing with uh, certain kinds of pollutants that we've been able to see in our urban canyons and our urban environments. Um, also the idea of being able to create habitat and deal with urban reforestation where you actually have uh, tree programs that are branching out now and spreading into other realms of vegetation so that we're able to at the streetscape level in particular uh, integrate these into our environment softening that environment uh, and principally uh, those are probably the most critical reasons that we're seeing right now for adaptation for facades. So you see, you think we've seen some uh, growing policy support for green facade implementation as part of improved streetscape, air quality, cooling, all those public benefits? Uh, in a number of cities in North America, they've uh, not only established policies now, but there are uh, numerous projects in a variety of different cities from Seattle to San Francisco to Chicago and Philadelphia, New York, uh, and on and on, where um, there's now not only a policy in place, but in many cases, dozens and dozens of projects which have been documented and incorporated. And there's a teaching program that goes on all the way in through the building departments now for the projects that come through within those policy constraints for people to be able to really discern what are effective ways of uh, adaptation for this particular kind of technology and how they're able to fulfill policy. 
Well, that's great. That's very promising. Melissa, what do you um, think about the kind of green wall projects you're seeing, the living wall projects on the exterior buildings? Is it the same kind of drivers as green facade? Are there different drivers at, at play here? Why are people doing investing in these technologies? I think that the LEED certification drives some, spe some people towards this kind of technology, especially for the urban heat island effect mitigation. But another thing that we've seen lately, uh, we've gotten a lot of interest from healing centers, hospitals, oncology centers, places like that where people want to bring plants into the arena where it's easy for them to access them, for the patients to be able to get right up close and touch them. It makes them feel better. It helps the healing process speed up. Um, we had a, a personal experience where I had a green wall and a gentleman who was visually impaired and handicapped in a wheelchair was able to come right up to the wall and smell it and touch it and was amazed that the plants were up at his level. He was actually fascinated because he can't really bend down to go look at plants or touch them or smell them. So it was a really great thing to see somebody have that wonderful experience and get really close and personal with the plants because of the living wall technology. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot more um, research being conducted on the, the health, human health benefits of greening, mm -hmm. you know, that build on this notion that E.O. Wilson had about biophilic, the biophilia hypothesis, the idea that we have an affinity to natural forms and that if we surround ourselves with natural forms, then we are healthier physically and, and mentally. Are you, are you seeing anything, like I guess you're describing some of that uh, you know, with the projects that you're working on, the healing guarding projects? Yeah, we've done Alzheimer's strolling gardens. We've done a project for cancer patients in recovery and their families so that they could have a living wall on their terrace in an urban area and have a garden where they wouldn't have been able to before. So I'm seeing a lot of interest in that area. Excellent. So uh, you can see there's a lot of reasons for installing uh, green wall technologies. Let's talk a little bit about design and maintenance now. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, you, Melissa, since uh, we're chatting right now. Um, from a, from a, if, in terms of best practices, are you a, a seeing emerging some best practices around the design and how it relates to the maintenance of, of these uh, of living wall systems that you work with? We what kind of practices? We interact an awful lot with architects. Um, we try to get them geared in the planning stages to think about all the elements from not only the design but the ongoing maintenance of the living walls after they're installed as a complete package rather than just part of the design and the construction. So we try to orient them and the clients that we meet immediately towards thinking about the the commitment they're making and the long-term mm -hmm. commitment having a living wall will be. Yeah, someone once described uh, building a living wall system as as as, uh, as taking bringing a puppy home. You know, there's a real yes. commitment that one has to make. Yes. Uh, have you um, have you uh, seen any um, in terms of operationalizing that sort of commitment? What are the kind of things that you encourage the design community to? Uh, to deal with? What are there some specific elements maybe you can share about living wall systems and some of the practices you see working? Um, one thing we try to plan for oftentimes the water quality, the water control for the irrigation systems is very important for any living wall, especially hydroponic systems. So we try to work with the planners and designers to think about having the facility so that they can have proper water temperature, water quality, because those things really affect the viability of a living wall as it progresses. So water is really fundamentally instrumentally important. Yes. What about things like plant selection? Is that something that uh, where you as a, a manufacturer sort of have that well in hand or is that something that where does the plant selection issue? I, I come from a northern climate and we don't have a lot of living walls uh, where I come from because it's seemingly so cold outside. In the winter time we, we have trouble keeping them alive. I'm wondering how do you deal with the plants? What, what's your approach to plant selection? Are you still um, with me there? Yeah. No? Yeah, I lost my earpiece, sorry. Um, our approach to plant selection is the right plant for the right place. 
coming from a background of a horticulturalist, I understand doing landscape design that you cannot put the wrong plant in the wrong aspect, in the wrong region. Uh, and there are particular things about a living wall system that are even more unique. The plant material you select has to be even more hardy than a typical plant in that region or it won't survive because it's in a container. So typically we recommend that we, that someone would zone their plants up two zones from where they normally would. So if I'm in okay. zone seven, I would be using zone five plants because they're more cold hardy and the roots of the plants are more exposed in a the shallow rooted containers of most modular systems. So that's one recommendation. Another is that like a green roof scenario, a living wall system is not a natural environment. So certain plant material is going to do better than others. Fibrously rooted material does better. Or shallow rooted material does better. And there are microclimates in every wall that affect how a plant's gonna do. Sometimes certain plants just don't like to live in certain areas. And that's not something anyone can predict until you're on site at some times. Right, okay. Um, what about you, uh, James? Have you got any thoughts to share about green facades and their design and, and the, the maintenance issues and opportunities that arise in terms of best practices? Well, I think that what we're seeing is uh, because of the scalability of facade systems that we're dealing with larger um, applications and um, how the maintenance program fits into that because it's generally an exterior application that you see that incorporated into landscaping aspects. Uh, generally, the facades quite often are part of the building component originally uh, in their design decisions. So what we need to do is we need to engage early on the architect and the owner and an integrated design team with engineers as well because many times we're dealing with elevations where we're 40 or 60 foot in height. You have certain kinds of wind loading conditions that have to be dealt with. Uh, you have certainly the aspects of the geography and the climates as well as exposures that you have within the individual siting of the building. And you put all of that together and it really requires kind of an early checklist of uh, incorporating the unique qualities of the prescribed facade as it's being laid out and what the particular benefits are that are being designed for. If you are dealing with urban heat island issues and you're dealing with a shade coefficient, you need to be able to maintain that and then sustain it over a long time, long period of these facades. Generally, we're looking at lifetime cycles of 20 or 30 years and longer for some of these vine and plant species. So the maintenance component becomes not only uh, how the initial installation needs to be executed, but it also needs to revolve around how the ownership uh, understands, the client understands responsibility for maintaining the plants to be able to de deliver the specific benefits that are being designed for. So there's a relationship there that needs to be considered and a lot of the times it's around the generalized components for soils, soil volumes. Many of these vine species become tree-like. You need to understand their pruning cycles and how they're going to deliver, whether they're going to be heavily laden with uh, flowering or fruiting. Uh, the selection of plant material needs to be considered early on because that really does affect a maintenance budget. So the long-term execution of some of these really large facade walls is needs to be very well understood early on for how the maintenance is incorporated. So it sounds like the plants are really sort of at the epicenter of a lot of the decisions that have to be made around green facade systems. Well, we really, really consider that you do have two components. One is the static system of the structure itself, whether it's cables that need retentioning or if it's a modular structure uh, made from recycled steel wire that needs to be inspected over the periods of winters and winter cycles, exposures to snow climates or snow removal materials or the acidics that come with salt. You need to be able to consider where the individual uh, environment is, where the facade is being installed, and that static system needs to be inspected separately from how the plants are performing. And the plant being a living system is going to require those kinds of endurances for a scheduled maintenance program, how it's going to mature a newly 
a planted plant that's coming out of a small container for its first few years of life is going to require a different kind of regimen than a tree which become a vine tree which has a caliper of six or eight inches and maybe covers 40 or 60 feet in height and spreads an enormous amount of canopy. Uh, you're going to have to change and adjust those over a period of time. So the discussion of maintenance does center quite a bit around the plant selection and what's going to happen over time and also the static system as well. Okay. Um, Chris, have you got anything to add in terms of best practices for interior uh, green walls or bio walls? Well, the uh, interesting thing when you're dealing with the interior system is that the typical landscaper that knows an interior landscape is oftentimes very different than the exterior landscaper who's, uh, who, could be, who, who either understands or can be trained to understand exterior plants on a vertical surface as well as they understand their typical plants that they're taking care, care of uh, in the horizontal. Uh, when you get into interiors, it's the same sort of scenario. There are a, a specialized class of landscape contractors, uh, typically referred to as interior scapers. Uh, these folks are the ones who really have, ex have the expertise in dealing with interiors. They understand the different plant varieties. So they understand what's typically available in an area. They understand uh, the light levels that are required. Because light levels uh, tend to be really a, a highly critical element when it comes to interior application. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we see for uh, interior living walls is that uh, the owner might be willing to spend some money and, and really commit to doing a living wall, but unfortunately what they aren't willing to commit to is to make sure that the lighting is sufficient to keep those plants alive or to keep the, uh, keep the, the living wall really, really uh, thriving the way they want to see that. And that oftentimes can cost you know, a substantial portion comparable to what the cost of a living wall is to itself. So the understanding of, the, uh, of a living wall isn't just that I want a green spot over or underneath that staircase over there. It's understanding what are the plants really going to take that are going into that space. So it may be at the design level. It may be at the contractor level uh, to initially understand how are we going to put these plants in this location? How are we going to get water to them? How are we going to get water away from them in the case of drainage? Uh, how are we going to make sure they have plenty of light? How are we going to make sure they get fertilized? So there are a lot of aspects of an interior living wall that while sharing you know, fundamentally the same, same characteristics as an exterior living wall, it's just in a very different environment. And so uh, they're different plants, and usually a different contractor is going to be required with a different set of expertise to at least understand what's going to work and what isn't. Um, you know, this question comes up all the time when I'm talking with people, and uh, both in the green roof and the, the green wall industry, so I thought I would put it to you, uh, you experts. Um, is there some way of characterizing the, the cost of maintaining a green wall, these different green wall systems? Is there some rule of thumb that one might apply um, to understanding uh, the nature of, you know, what it's going to take to, you know, raise that puppy that you bring home from the Humane Society, you know, take care of that green wall, that living system. Chris, have you got any way of communicating that that you might be able to share with anyone uh, who's listening? Well, that's, it's, a, it's a great question, Stephen. Um, I wish I had a better handle on that. Honestly, as a manufacturer of living wall systems, we have, we have a pretty good grasp of what it takes to put one up. Uh, we have on occasion done that ourselves, but for the most part, we're working with contractors, architects, landscape architects in the design and installation phase, and then when it gets to the, uh, the maintenance phase, uh, that is out of our wheelhouse, so I don't have a, a real confident way of telling you the exact number. Maybe, Melissa, you have a better answer to that. I think you get a little more involved in that I'm than not we looking. Do. I'm not looking for an exact number here. I'm <laughs> looking for like a, 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 general, a generality. Uh, yes, yes. I can give you it, a range. It depends. It depends. The em emerging sort of benchmark is somewhere in the three to five dollars a square foot per visit for a maintenance visit. So that has another variable of as far as how many maintenance visits you're going to schedule. An interior wall may have 52 visits a, a year because it may be a weekly maintenance, whereas an exterior wall in a cold climate, for example, we have one where there are bi-monthly visits in the winter months because it's not necessary to be there every, every month. And then there are twice a month 
in the growing season. So you can do the math that way, but three to five dollars a square foot is about the emerging number I'm hearing from most of the maintenance companies I work with. That's their mobilization right. cost, the tasks they have to do, that sort of thing. That's where we're about averaging. And I think, Stephen, the thing to really realize in this is that uh, we frequently see installations where uh, the owners are committed. You talk about raising that puppy. The owner says, I'm happy to ta let you take care of it for the first year. And after that, we're just going to put our maintenance guys onto the living wall. And we have seen no end of living wall failures based on owners believing that the maintenance that someone's doing, even if they're showing up, you know, Melissa mentioned, they might be only showing up uh, twice a month to do this. And so how hard could it be to get my contractor or my, my maintenance person in to maintain this living wall? And, and time and time again, the understanding of the plant, the understanding of the irrigation, the understanding of fundamentally what's at play with the living wall just is never is something that does not get translated very well to an internal maintenance staff. And so the number one thing to uh, advise a client is let a professional do it because that way you retain the, uh, the investment that you put into that wall and you make sure that it continues to look good. Can right. I add or, something to or, that too? Or Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I also hear something else going on where a maintenance company has to have some time in for a learning curve to understand the rhythm of the wall. You know, the actual microclimate specifics about that particular wall. So then what happens in some cases, if it's a corporate account, at the end of the year, we send this out to bid to three other companies, and the company that's been working with the wall and knows how the ins and outs of it and the feel of the wall is ousted for a company that brings in a lower bid, and they start the process all over again year after year, and in the meantime, lose plants and have failures or mortality, and then go back to the original company. So there's some particular skills that a maintenance company has to have and I think they have to have experience with the wall to get better and better and do a better job. Okay James you got any ideas on maintenance costs that you want to share for green facades and well I think that uh, most of these facades are certainly exterior installations of f somewhat familiar plant types in their geographic region so the landscape community generally has best practice um, regimen pretty well in place for how to deal with the general site conditions in a landscaping environment. Aside from that, one of the conditions that occurs and certainly probably should be added to the design considerations for maintenance is accessibility. Many of the facade walls are quite tall and quite mm -hmm. and, and require specific access and you just can't hang on and climb up the face of the scale of building you need to have a boom or you have to have some other Cherry additional picker. access something like that that allows you to maintain the plant in its optimum condition and trim it seasonally or whatever else it might need in its uh, maintenance regimen so along with the generalized specifications for maintenance that happen in landscaping for irrigation, checking the systems to make sure that they're functioning correctly, applying the correct nutrients, composting, and etc. The vines themselves or the runners or scramblers that establish themselves to some elevation do need elevated maintenance. And that requires some accessibility. Now, some of the projects that we've been working on don't have ground plane access, so they are actually elevated from planter systems and begin on the second floor and go through the fifth floor or something like that. So there needs to be some advanced planning there architecturally for either having access to maintain those planter beds and the irrigation systems, maintaining it in a healthy condition as a living system, or there has to be a position below where somebody can actually use uh, a boom or a cherry picker to get up and access the planters in the irrigation and control systems that are elevated. So that planning component needs to go into the maintenance considerations and is a, is a part of the budgeting that needs to happen and the education that needs to happen for uh, the, uh, the client or the building owner as well. And this can cause problems on a wide variety of uh, building types from retail even to uh, university 
and education environments where they have fairly large staffs, but they have limited access for, uh, you know, however many hours they need per square footage per year to maintain their landscaping environment. So um, a little bit different on the exterior systems where you're dealing with um, incorporating it generally into a contract situation for landscaping Okay, I don't, I don't recall. I didn't quite catch the the rule of thumb in terms of the <laughs> dollar cost per square foot the way Melissa gave. But I think you did a great job of explaining some of the factors that. But there is no real rule rule of thumb then for green facades. You can't say it's fifty cents a square, fifty cents to a dollar per square foot. There's just nothing like that out there right now, James. Nothing like that out there right now, except that within the landscape maintenance community, there are some rules of thumb for maintaining general landscape environments and that's how mostly the landscape contractors are accepting a contract are sort of defaulting to those levels. Can right. I also it, go, ahead. go ahead. Can I also add uh, along the lines of what James mentioned about accessibility that's the biggest variable that I'm seeing in maintenance contracts costs. Um, specifically, I saw we have done very large modular exterior walls which have accessibility challenges as well. And I saw that originally a maintenance access plan wasn't in place for that wall. They were using a crane to do the maintenance on a monthly basis. That was wildly expensive and not very effective for maintenance. So they were only able to do maintenance once a month and it was very expensive. So what they did as a solution was to put in davits in the roof and have a swing stage that they could bring to the site. Now they have accessibility whenever they want to set up the swing stage. It's half the cost it was before and they can do the maintenance twice as often. So the wall is healthier and the maintenance contract is less expensive. So accessibility and planning for it is a very key portion of your living wall planning, especially for your ongoing maintenance. So I guess my last question is, are there any other maintenance related challenges? We sort of started talking about that already. Are there any other maintenance related challenges that you see? Obviously access is very important for all types of green wall systems. Um, that's a big contributor to the cost of maintenance. Are there any other maintenance issues that that we're seeing out there sort of in the trenches, so to speak, that you would like to share with the audience and how we might overcome them or address them? Chris? Uh, anybody? Well, Melissa? I guess we're, we're involved in, a, in uh, several projects right now where we are using uh, essentially harvested water, uh, roof harvested water in uh, living wall systems. And it's been an interesting challenge to, one would think that, oh, it's no big deal, it's just the rain that's falling and making sure the water's right. But uh, Melissa's point to the quality of the water and uh, the, the continuity of being able to get that water uh, can definitely be a challenge at time. How are we storing it? What are we doing with that water? And uh, how, are you, how are we really making sure that it has the, uh, has the, has the correct, uh, it doesn't have stuff in it we don't want as it were. So that's one element that we've seen. But I think that she probably hit most of the, uh, the really important points on there. If there's one thing that I would probably talk about as, as the most important thing, it is having a, having a, we deal with a lot of different people, uh, little different designers putting our systems in, different contractors putting our systems on, in, and the key truly is in the long run, getting a quality, a quality contractor who's committed to doing the job correctly. Uh, there are a lot of people, as, as Melissa mentioned, that they'll just bid to get the work because they want the rest of the project or whatever else but really don't understand what they're getting into, they have never maintained a living wall, or haven't been trained. I mean, one good example is uh, by finding someone who has their, uh, their GRP accreditation, that they're actually going to have some, somebody who has an idea of what a living wall is and how to maintain it. Uh, we've been trying to emphasize to the, with the uh, designers that we have in the specifications that the maintenance should be done by someone who is a trained professional or at least has a, has a history of maintaining and working with living walls or has been, uh, has been certified by one of the manufacturers to really understand the system. Uh, you just can't underestimate the fact that, that these people know what they're doing and if, they, if you don't have that person in place, 
it's an awful lot of money to spend on something that uh, that may well fail. Do you certify uh, contractors, Melissa or, or Christopher or James? Is, are any of you involved in contractor certification for maintaining these systems? We don't certify contractors, but what we do is have a technical consultant who's on the installation site with the company when they're doing their installation. We also train all the maintenance companies that take over our walls after we in install them. So you do have a, you don't certify them, but you train. We train you have a training yes. program for them. Yep. We, we, have, we had a, a separate contract with the wall owner where we oversee the maintenance company and train them and are available to help them when they need it. We found, uh, we, we have done a, a little bit, we've done quite a bit of training and, and like Melissa, we'll end up having consultants out and have, uh, have our people out working with the contractors as the walls go in. Uh, and, and while we would like to be able to have that certification level and like to be able to have that control, I think the bigger issue comes not around the, the first initial installation of the living wall, but really it comes back down to the long term. It is exactly what Melissa said. It's, it's that after that first year when the company decides, well, let's just put this out to bid, and no one really thinks, should we have someone that's been trained? Should we have someone in there? It takes an owner that really understands what they're dealing with to... Uh, and who has a commitment to this. And I think that that probably is a lot of people that we still see, they're attracted to the novelty of a living wall. They're attracted to the, 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 the greenwashing, the spin that they can put on a living wall. But to really get someone who's committed to doing it and doing it right, they've got a multi-year commitment to doing that. And that's really where the training is able to be done best. And I think what Chris is talking to about is cl managing client expectations as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big problem and challenge we come up against often. We're dealing with living plant material. It's not going to look like wallpaper or a painting or perfect at every moment of every day. So, you what? know, what? <laughs> <laughs> the blessing and curse about a living wall is oftentimes it's a focal point of a, of a, a green building. So it's scrutinized. And so when something is out of place or plants are going through a natural cycle mm -hmm. and they have some brown leaves and that sort of thing, people kind of hit the panic button, not really realizing it's a living thing, it's going to go through cycles, and it's going to have to be cared for. I mean, I've come from the landscape and wholesale nursery production business where, you know, somebody buys a hanging basket and it's beautiful in the store and they hang it on their porch and then they come back two weeks later and it's this brown shriveled thing and they say, what happened? This is a faulty plant. You sold me this horrible thing. And then I'll say, well, did you water the plant? Well, I, I, I thought it was wet enough. It seemed fine. Well, where did you put it? Well, you know, in the porch underneath the thing. With no sun? No, no. So, did it need sun? Oh, well, yes. <laughs> that could be the reason it's dead. So, people yeah. think that plants can take care of themselves and will always look great like they did in the store or the first day it got installed or in a picture they saw. But it's a dynamic thing that changes and your clients have to expect it's going to look funny in the winter or different in the winter. It doesn't mean it's dead. It's going to come back. You know, with similar things that people deal with mm -hmm. with green roofs as well. You know, we're, we're, dealing, we're dealing with a project right now. Uh, I, I guess I'd say that this is a, a highly experimental job that's going in. That we've, it's been in Minneapolis now for the last, uh, probably the last nine, ten months the uh, wall has been up. And it's really been interesting to watch the owner because it's, uh, they've been documenting month by month how does the wall look as it goes from this robust summer, uh, summer wall and gradually going into the fall and now that the wall has a foot and a half of snow on top of it in Minneapolis. Uh, it's definitely a different wall than it started, but the owners really understand that this is what they're getting into. They realize that this is what, uh, th you know, they, they understand it's going to go dormant or at least many of the plants are going to go dormant. Uh, one thing that I did want to mention that poses a particular challenge, and this is something we've continued to come up against uh, lately, has been uh, the insistence on a lot of municipalities and a lot of places that there's a real strong drive towards using native plants. 
And native plants are often wonderful. And uh, there are a lot of different varieties of native plants, obviously, depending upon where you go. But there are frequently tried and true ornamentals, nursery plants that uh, are not necessarily native that thrive on these living walls. And there are an awful lot of native plants that aren't going to thrive on living walls. And so what we found is there has been a, we've had to help some of the owners, some of the, uh, some of the designers, and oftentimes some of the permitting authorities, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a municipality or whether it's a, you know, for, for whatever reason, we had to explain to these folks that not everything, you can't use native on everything. And while it would be a lovely application to have nothing but native, Frequently, they, they don't perform the way that you might want them to, especially when you're putting the money into a living wall. I understand it's much the same that when you're dealing with, uh, with green roofs. In fact, that, uh, that at least some of the material can go in as native, but it doesn't necessarily all work out that way. Well, isn't it Ed Snodgrass who says a green roof environment's not really a native environment? So to really translate native plant material there doesn't always work. Um, Oftentimes, same, Chris, yeah, yeah native, a lot of native plants, especially prairie grasses and perennial type natives, have a very deep taproot so that they can always get to water. That's how they survive. So they wouldn't really work well in a shallow media system like a living wall. James, do you have anything to add to that uh, point? Well, I, th I think that facades fall into a significantly different category for uh, maintenance and the initial question that you had about the major uh, hurdle that we see uh, moving forward is an absence of a maintenance budget. Uh, in a facade environment generally you may have a wall that's as high as 40 feet or more and they may be planting plant material which is only two feet and there is a growing cycle and series of years that are going to have to take place before you're going to populate a facade and fulfill really what its design goal and intents are and so its maintenance and its nurturing are going to take place over a long period of time and might be significantly different for something that's only three or four meters high but for a larger installations the maintenance program and its budget allocation over a longer period of time and a longer commitment and cycle until that plant material becomes substantial enough to produce the amount of tree canopy or leaf canopy that's desired. Um, there's going to be significantly different than installing something that's pretty much fresh from the nursery and coming in as a very established and prolific plant of whatever dimension are required for the living wall component. So we see significantly different challenges for maintenance and they're generally around training people to manage those plants over a longer period of time and making sure that those beds are getting renewed every year and that there is a maintenance that's com that involves composting and checking on the irrigation systems along the lines of a landscaping package, which is what we see most often on a campus environment. Right. So uh, we can see there's some fairly significant difference between different types of green wall technologies that exist in the marketplace. Um, does anyone else have any other sort of gems of uh, shared wisdom they'd like to provide before we uh, we close? Uh, I'll add one other challenge that we have with exterior walls in cold climates. Um, by their nature, plants do still need water in winter months. Even though they're dormant, they still require water. You don't realize it, but in the wintertime, when plants go dormant, they have snow cover, they get rainwater, and water is available to them whenever they need it. So when temperatures warm up and the plants start to thaw, they start to take up water. If they're in a, a living wall environment where there's a limited space of soil media or hydroponic uh, blanket or something that carries the water, and there's no water available in that media or substrate when they come out of their freeze, they will die. That is the number one reason that plants don't make it through the winter is that they lose their water through their leaves in the winter time and they try to take it up through the roots and they're not able to. So we constantly battle with people who are doing maintenance as far as training them to 
water the wall in the winter time to build an irrigation system that allows them to water in the winter or to actually hand water living walls so that they'll survive. It's a very important and key uh, factor to having an exterior wall live in a cold environment. And everyone is, seems more concerned about the irrigation system cracking than they are about the plants dying. <laughs> <laughs> so they want to okay. blow out the irrigation system. The pipes are going to freeze. Well, yeah. the, all the plants are going to die. So the $5 a square foot irrigation system is a lot easier to replace than all the plants in your living wall. <laughs> I think I think if we can drag the garden hose out, and, you know, yeah. when it's below zero to make a little skating rink for the kids, <laughs> you can probably drag the garden hose out to just spray it on the green wall if that's yeah. what's uh, required. Yeah. Uh, some great uh, some great commentary there. Thank thank you much very much, James Sable from Green Screen, and Christopher Lyon from Turner Cell Site Works, and of course. Melissa from um, uh, Grow uh, Plant Connection. Um, it's been great that you share your uh, expertise and wisdom. We have an introductory course. There are books on green walls and uh, lots of opportunity for this uh, this new type of living architecture system and, and some very important lessons that we will hopefully share with you today. Thanks very much and, and good luck with the rest of your virtual summit.